Sheikh Imran, what, what, why is there shooting going on between India and Pakistan, the, across the border in Kashmir? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Maurice. It's good to be talking with you again after some time. And uh, I'm glad that we are doing this interview at this time because many things are coming together at the same time around the world. Uh, all pointing in the direction of a grand climax of a historical process which has been uh, unfolding for quite some time now. Uh, the micro-analysis is important, but we can only understand micro-analysis and be accurate in micro-analysis if it is linked to and it conforms with an accurate macro analysis. And our macro analysis comes from our eschatology, as you know very well, Maurice. And uh, the battle which is now going on in the world, the intellectual battle in politics, the intellectual battle in economics, the intellectual battle in monetary economics, is from our perspective going to be won by eschatology. And that is that they are those who want to rule the world in order that they be able to deliver to the state of Israel the status of ruling state in the world. And when they deliver that to Israel, then a man will emerge in Israel as the ruler of Israel and who will declare in Jerusalem that he is the Messiah. But he would not be the Messiah. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, Prophet Muhammad Islam, said that he would be the false Messiah. The subject of the Messiah and the return of the Messiah, the son of Mary, and the false Messiah, all of this belongs to eschatology. Secular scholarship is not willing, is adamant, not entering into the field of eschatology. That is the choice of secular scholarship. But we, from the viewpoint of eschatology, we will not allow them to get away. We are demonstrating that when we apply eschatology to our political analysis, our economic analysis, our monetary economic analysis, analysis. Not only can we explain the past more accurately, better, more convincingly, but more importantly, we are the ones who can anticipate what's coming. There are critics who declare only God knows, only Allah knows the future. And we say to them, don't businessmen, good businessmen, don't they anticipate market trends? <laughs> That's what a good businessman does. If a good is businessman to study the market and anticipate in which way the market is going, why can't we do the same thing with history? So we dismiss, we dismiss those pathetic critics who all that they have to do is to say only God knows the future. We say to them, why don't you leave us alone? Why don't you leave us alone? There are many who are interested in our analysis. There are many who are interested in our eschatology, so kindly leave us alone. We don't have time for you. It is in the perspective of that eschatological analysis of events unfolding in the world and about to unfold that we can look at Pakistan. That when the, when the British were about to uh, decolonize, and it was never the intention of European colonization to remain permanent as colonizers. No. The purpose of European colonization was to dismantle existing political and economic and monetary institutions, educational institutions, and replace them with institutions manufactured in Europe. And then you decolonize. So you can then continue to rule that society and influence that society.
by proxy. So from the time the British decided to withdraw from India, the battle began. So what's going to be the post-colonial uh, subcontinent? And Pakistan came into being as a victory for Europe. Pakistan is a victory for Europe because what should have occurred upon decolonization was that the Muslims would, in India, the Muslims in India would recognize that there is no such thing as Islamic imperialism and that Muslim rule over India for so many hundred years, of, oh, so many hundreds of years, was in fact Islamic imperialism. It should have been denounced by sensible Muslims. An apology should have been extended to the Hindus of India for that Islamic imperialism. And an effort should have been made to work out a relationship with Hindu India. That uh, all that the Muslims are asking for in a post-colonial India, all that we are asking for, nothing else, is our freedom to remain Muslims, to live as Muslims in accordance with the way of life of Islam. That's all we're asking for, nothing else. And if that had been offered to the Hindus, then India would have become an independent state, but with the Muslims allowing, uh, having their freedom to live as Muslims. That's not what the British wanted, no. So Pakistan came into being as a clone of secular Turkey, Mustafa Kemal's Turkey. And from the day that Pakistan was born to this day, Pakistan has been ruled and controlled by proxy from Washington. And when Washington feared that elections would not deliver to them a pro-Western government, they had no qualms in rigging elections. In 1976, in response to the Lahore, the 1973 war, between the Arabs and Israel, resulted, as you know, in the draw, it was planned that way. And then the sudden rise in the price of oil gave to the Americans an opportunity of a lifetime to replace Bretton Woods with a petrodollar system. That's when they went, the Kissinger went to Faisal and made that infamous deal that oil will now be sold for only US dollars. And once once face had agreed to that, the dollar survived. And the dollar has flowed even far, even higher since then. The petrodollar system, the petrodollar monetary system was even more beneficial to the Zionists than the Bretton Woods monetary system. Mm -hmm. King Faisal agreed to it because he didn't have the knowledge. He was convinced that Kissinger was right, that the petro, the Arab oil um, the money then from the sale of oil would rise spectacularly. It did rise spectacularly. The income came tremendously more than it was before. From the start of the war in 1973, uh, when oil was at $40 a barrel, it rose to 160, a 400% rise in the price of oil. And the Arabs who were getting $3 a barrel were not getting $12 a barrel. And Kissinger was able to convince Faisal that this $12 a barrel is peanuts for what you will be getting. Kissinger was right. And Faisal bought it. And Faisal then agreed to this infamous deal that the Arab oil producing countries will sell their oil for only US dollars. That's the petrodollar monetary system. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in Pakistan has the, he had the political genius to recognize an opportunity in that war and the rise of price of oil. And uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto then reached out to Faisal to try to make a deal that will exploit the new opportunity which is him. And that's when they organized the Lahore Islamic Summit Conference of Islamic States in uh, February of 1974. And for the first time since the Ottoman Caliphate was abolished in 1924. For the first time, 50 years, the world of Islam was coming together to unite in a unity that would be meaningful and could deliver 
some kind of power to the world of Islam and integrity. And uh, the Western world warned Bhutto, he'll make a horrible example of you, don't do this. They warned him and warned him and warned him. And to his credit, to his credit, Zulfat, Hulsikari, Bhutto never stepped down, never backed down. Subsequent political leaders in Pakistan, rulers in Pakistan, never had the kind of backbone that Zulfikar Ali Bhutto had in standing up for the Western world. The present government in Pakistan is, is a shameful government with a backbone made of recycled paper. I don't care if they annoyed with me. That's what they are. They are stooges of the Saudis who are in terms stooges of the Zionists. So that's the kind of government that Pakistan has today. But the Pakistanis will remember 1976 when Bhutto has stood up against them and they decided to make a horrible example of him. Yeah, the Lahore Summit Conference took place in February 1974. In, Ma in April 1976, the Western world responded using India. And Indira Gandhi exploded the first Indian nuclear blast. And India joined the nuclear club two months after the Lahore Islamic Company. That entry of India into the nuclear club would meant, was meant to impact upon Pakistan and demoralize Pakistan so that Pakistan and Bhutto would not continue on the path on which they were going. This is the kind of leadership that Pakistan wanted. Men of integrity, men who would stand up and defy those who want to rule the world. Eventually, they got rid of Bhutto, as they got rid of Faisal. And as soon as they got rid of Faisal, Saudi foreign policy turned 180 degrees. Everything that Faisal has stood for, as soon as he was assassinated, the Saudi government reneged on everything and turned back. Similarly with Bhutto. As soon as they got rid of Bhutto, Pakistan's foreign policy was again back into the hands of the Americans. And that was when the opportunity came with the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan to now join with the Americans in fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. Pakistan is back in the American camp, back in the CIA camp. When uh, uh, Zia will hack uh, had a change in heart and was turning back towards the way of life of Islam. And I think that Ziaul Haq was sincere in this change that he was making. He was formerly, like all the rest, a stooge, doing the work <laughs> that the masters wanted of him. But then afterwards, there was a sincere change in the man. They got rid of him. And in the process of getting rid of the old hug, it didn't matter to them that the American ambassador had to die. They didn't matter to them. And so Pakistan since then has been in the hands of those who are subservient to Washington, to Saudi Arabia. And in the last elections in Pakistan, I, I was convinced that there was massive rigging. This is why they brought the system of democracy with elections. In our political system, you have accountability. That when you make a political choice, you cannot do it anonymously. No, not in our political system. There is accountability for your choice. You cannot hide behind an anonymous vote. In their political system, you don't have to be accountable because your vote is secret, <laughs> you see? And so you can rig an election. And that's what they've been doing any time they're in trouble, they rigged elections. In 1976, what they did to Bhutto, and I have first-hand evidence, I, the, the, a professor, a Pakistani professor, who is a professor in the United States of America, spoke to me and told me that he himself personally took a briefcase packed with US dollars to Pakistan given to him to deliver to a political party in Pakistan to influence the voting in elections in 1976. The man confessed to me. That's what the CIA were doing. 
And when Bhutto realized that this is what was happening, that the CIA was trying to buy the elections, he then responded and rigged the elections. And that's what happened in the last elections in Pakistan. So if the Pakistani people are now rising up, perhaps it's because enough is enough. Enough is enough. We want leaders who can be faithful to us and not bend down and kiss a Saudi foot and bend down and worship Washington. Maybe that's what the Pakistani people want. But that's not what India wants. And that's not what Saudi Arabia wants. And that's not what the Zionists want. So if the demonstrations in Pakistan are now threatening this Saudi government in Pakistan, in Islamabad, then a good thing to do would be to try to create a diversion. And so India steps in conveniently to create a diversion that the Pakistani armed forces, Pakistani government will be grateful for. So attention is diverted now to possibility of an India-Pakistan war. And your attention is diverted away from the threat to the government. But I don't think that uh, the leaders, uh, Imran Khan, who is a former critica, a cricketer, and the, the Islamic scholar, uh, Professor Tahir al I don't think that they are fools. <laughs> and I think they realize that what India is doing is trying to help out the Pakistani government with what is happening on the ceasefire line. This is my answer to you, uh, Morris. I, I can only hope. I can only hope that the people of Pakistan one day, one day, might once again be able to get a leadership that will stand up to Saudi Arabia, and stand up to the Zionists, and stand up to Washington, the way Russia is doing it today. I, if democracy can indeed produce any real leader, it seems to have in Russia, but uh, that's unusual. They did try to. They did try to buy the Russian election, didn't they? But they didn't succeed. I think what is happening in Russia is that we're seeing the return of the Russian people to their roots. They are an intensely spiritual people, unlike Western Europe. They're grounded in spirituality, in mysticism. And uh, the Orthodox Christian Church wields far more influence amongst the Russian people than the Roman Catholic Church or the Protestant Church wields. He is in Western Europe. So despite 60, 70, 80 years of atheist communist Soviet rule and uh, Zionist created Soviet rule and 60, 70, 80 years of persecution of the Orthodox Christian Church or what the Quran refers to as room, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity has survived, has survived. And it is returning now to Russia. And one of the most visible, one of the most visible evidence of that return of the Christian church, the Orthodox Christian church as the foundation of Russian society, is Russia's rejection of uh, any kind of uh, um, compromise on uh, uh, gay marriages, homosexual, homosexuality. Uh, it is a part of Western civilization today, and Russia is not a part of Western civilization, not at all. It is now a part of Western civilization, despite the efforts of many in the Western world who are appalled by it, that the, the Western, Western society is being taken in a direction of uh, eventual accommodation and acceptance of homosexuality at the level of the state and at the level of the law. And the Russian so society has rejected that. 
adamant. I give that as evidence for those doubting Thomases, and there are some of them around, who believe that Russia is a Zionist state, and the Russian government is in the pockets of the Zionists. And I don't have any more time to waste with such foolishness. Um, and the evidence is that since Russia is returning to Christianity, that it is the destiny of the Orthodox Christian Church to challenge the oppression in the Holy Land. Because Holy Russia, <laughs> in their imagination, includes the Holy Land. Holy Russia, the territory, the territory of Holy Russia includes the Holy Land. That's Russian thinking. Yes. Um, so it is the destiny of Russia to resist them, the Zionists and the oppression. And it is the destiny of the world of Islam to also resist them, the oppression. That oppression is most glaringly evident in Gaza just yesterday. And so, Morris, we are likely to see, this is macro analysis, Morris, that the world is likely to see, in fact, more than that, it is inevitable that the world is going to see an alliance of the followers of Prophet Muhammad, God's blessings be upon him, Allah's blessings be upon him, with Orthodox Christianity, which today is led by Russia. Russia has taken a strange stance in Egypt by backing Sisi and essentially going against the Muslim Brotherhood, which was Islam, political Islam. The Muslim Brotherhood may have in its ranks, or must surely have in its ranks, people with sincere love for Islam. But that is no excuse <laughs> for wrong policies. The Muslim Brotherhood probably now, too late, probably now recognizes Saudi Arabia to be a Zionist state. But all these years that the Muslim Brotherhood was in the wilderness, they always looked up to Saudi Arabia as a model of a Sharia compliant country. This short sightedness on the leadership of the Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, made it made them vulnerable to be taken for a ride by Hillary Clinton. To make a deal with Washington. Yes, that's what they did. And then the short sightedness was even further. Uh when they got on board the bandwagon, the Saudi bandwagon, and the Qatari bandwagon, to open the doors of Egypt for so-called warriors to go and fight in Syria. Yeah. Condemning the Syrian government and supporting the insurrection to overthrow the Syrian government. That was the brotherhood. The foolishness and the mistakes and the misguidance of that government was so great that I am grateful that they are out of power. Their last mistake was their biggest mistake of all. The Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, used a constitution to unite a people as a polity. He did that when he migrated from Mecca to Medina. And in Medina, he found so many Jewish tribes, some of which were at war with each other, and so many pagan Arab tribes, some of which were at war with each other. And over seven months of painstaking negotiations, he was able to weld together, and bring together all of these tribes in a political unity on the basis of a constitution, the constitution of Medina. And it gave to each of these units of the state political equality with all other units. It preserved the rights and interests of each unit of the state. It recognized the plurality of the political order. 
It was a genius at work. But the Mursi government and the Ikhwan al Muslimun just will not listen to others. No. They have their ears blocked. They don't listen to anybody else. They are the only custodians of the truth. And so they went ahead, went ahead with a constitution in Egypt. And when the Christians of Egypt would not agree, and the secular forces in Egypt would not agree, they decided to go alone. And stupidly, this is a harsh word, stupidly, proceeded to a referendum on the constitution and to enact the constitution. Instead of uniting Egypt, the constitution divided Egypt as Egypt had never been divided before. Once the Egyptian armed forces saw an opportunity, this is called political opportunism, they took over the country. If the Egyptian armed forces had one US dollar, because that's the only money they recognized, had one US dollar of integrity in them, they would have announced to Egypt that we are taking control of the country and we promise you never to return it to the people until, until we can have a constitution that will unite the people. And on the day that you can negotiate amongst yourselves and arrive at a constitution that will unite the people, we promise you to hand over power. If they had one US dollar worth of integrity, they would have done that. But they didn't take over the country for the benefit of Egypt. They took over the country because they wanted to control the gravy train. That's why. The Russian government wasn't concerned. <laughs> the Russian government was not concerned about why the Egyptian armed forces took over, whether they should have taken over or could not have taken over. What the Russian government was concerned about was that Morsi was gone. And therefore, a government in Egypt that was supporting the insurrection in Syria was gone. That's why they supported the government, and the Egyptian armed forces. It's politics of what is politically expedient for Russia. Is it not the case that in every Muslim's heart there should be a caliphate and that we should live under Sharia law? When you study eschatology, you would know that the world today is controlled by divine planning, by Gog and Magog. And those who control power in the world today are the ones who are responsible for the destruction of the caliphate. And uh, that they will never allow the caliphate or the caliphate to be restored. No. But they know that it is in the heart, in the heart of all Muslims to live lives which are faithful to Allah and to his messenger. That is what every Muslim has in his heart. That we want to faith, be faithful to our religion. And you cannot be faithful to your religion if your leader is appointed in Washington. <laughs> no. You are faithful to your religion when your leader is appointed by you. And he is responsible. That's what, what the Zionists want. They want to rule over you. So what they do is they take control of your government. What the Western world has done, the Zionists have done, is knowing that Muslims have this in their heart, that they want the return of the caliphate to the caliphate. And knowing that the time is now running short for Israel to wage a big war, which will witness the territorial expansion of the state. You know the, the prophets, You know what the Torah says, don't you? No. That the Holy Land. The Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Somebody wrote that nonsense with their own hands and put it in the Torah. The original Torah is not like that. No. So since Israel has to wage a big war, so that the territory of, this, the, territory of the state of Israel will expand dramatically, 
to encompass these false biblical principles. Israel has to create conditions that would allow her to wage that big war while yet not appearing to be a bully and an oppressor and look bad in the eyes of the world. So this is what I explained in my lecture 12 years ago in Sydney, is to create conditions which would allow the world to feel that Islam, Islam is rising once again as a force in the world. And that uh, an Islamic caliphate is returning. And that the Muslims are going to now slaughter the Jews uh, in Israel. And if Israel does not do something to defend itself, Israel will be destroyed. And more than that, all of mankind are now going to be threatened by this evil force called Islam. It's a propaganda offensive. And in order to succeed with that propaganda offensive, you don't need more than one dollar worth of intelligence to realize that they created, they manufactured ISIS. And they're the ones who programmed ISIS to claim that they are now the caliphate, or the khilafa. It's all part and parcel of the master plan, which will allow Israel to eventually wage a war that's already pre-planned. And Israel has all the weapons and the technology that the Arabs don't have to be able to wage that war and to be able to inflict horrendous damage on largely defenseless people who don't have the kind of weapons that Israel has. The Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, prophesied that wiping out the decimation of the Arabs. He did it. But I get emails from the Arabs themselves who are not convinced, who believe that my eschatology is fanciful. <laughs> and I hate to say to them, well, just wait and see. Just wait and see. The, the writing is on the wall if you can read the writing. That Israel is now ready to wage a big war. But before Israel can wage her big war of territorial expansion, to establish a political and economic dominion over the Arab world in particular, there's one big impediment in the way. And that big impediment is the two superpowers, the NATO alliance and Russia. That's the impediment. And in order to get rid of this major impediment, these two have to be put to fight with each other and destroy each other. A war of mutual destruction. That's the planning. That's Armageddon. That's the Malhama. But now I'd like to suggest to you, Morris, um, I did not understand it before, I have to confess. But I just returned from an Indonesia, from Jakarta. We had a retreat up in the mountains outside of Jakarta. And over there I realized two things that I had not realized before about this big war which is coming. And Ukraine is just a sideshow. <laughs> it's, it's just a catalyst, Ukraine, for what is already planned, a big war, which is going to be a nuclear war. And there can only be one nuclear war in history. <laughs> After that nuclear war, there's no more such thing as nuclear war. That's it, only one. And it's coming. And thank Allah that Russia is not prepared to back down. What I realized uh, while I was in Indonesia was that uh, I had mentioned to you previously a prophecy, a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, uh, in which he said that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold and the people will fight for that gold. And 99 out of every 100 will be killed. And everyone will say, I am the one who will survive. But the Muslims must not touch that gold. About two or three years ago, I interpreted the studies to be religious, religious symbolism. And I said that the mountain of gold is actually an ocean of oil underneath the river. 
And that ocean of oil is one day designed to function as gold. And that's what happened in 1973 when Kissinger made the agreement with Paisa. And the petrodollar monetary system came into being when Saudi Arabia agreed and the Arab oil producing states agreed that oil will be sold for only US dollars. The petrodollar monetary system came into being. And so the mountain of gold actually represents the petrodollar monetary system. And when the fight begins over the petrodollar monetary system, it will be the nuclear war because 99 out of every 100 will be killed. So I realized for the first time last month that the Malhama or Armageddon will actually be a war for the survival of the petrodollar monetary system. And Russia is leading the effort with BRICS to create an alternative monetary system. And so what we are seeing now is a struggle by the Western world, the Zionist-controlled Western world, a struggle which will end in nuclear war to preserve their bogus and fraudulent petrodollar monetary system. The new thing I also learned is that that petrodollar monetary system will not to the big war that's coming. No because Israel will survive that big war with large stocks of gold, in fact, and with the capacity to still impose its political and military and economic dominion over the Arabs. But then how will the petrodollar monetary system and the bogus monetary system that emerges under Israeli rule, how is it going to be challenged? Who will challenge it? The answer is, and I just realized this last month, our prophet has also made another prophecy. And I quoted this prophecy some 20 years ago in my book entitled One Jamaat, One Amir. That in the end time, the earth will vomit from its liver columns of gold and silver. I knew this 20 years ago, but I never understood how the vomiting will take place until I went to Indonesia uh, earlier this month, not last month. And while I was in that retreat in Indonesia, someone mentioned that Indonesia has a lot of active volcanoes. And in the island of Java, you find many Indonesians who are constantly digging for gold because the gold comes out from the volcanoes. And then it clicked, Boris, it clicked. That is what the prophet is talking about. That the gold is going to come out, the vomiting would be the volcanoes. So where will this take place? Obviously, it will have to take place in a part of the world where there are active volcanoes. And that will be a part of this design which do not have control. The only part of the world which qualifies is Indonesia. There are so many active volcanoes from Sumatra all the way down to the end that they actually call it a ring of fire. So the collapse of the monetary system will come when by divine providence huge amounts of gold will come into the world which are not under the control of the violence. Hmm? Um, I therefore uh, I'm looking forward now with more hope and more enthusiasm to the conclusion of this mysterious 
events unfolding in the world now, as knowledge comes, we get a better and better understanding of what is happening and what is going to come. And there is hope for those who stand up for justice, uh, over injustice and over oppression. That in the final, in the end, justice will be supreme in the world and truth will triumph over falsehood. And the Zionists are going to bite the dust. But, you know, today we, we have not really touched on Ukraine and there seem to be major developments there. The, the Russian speakers are making a big headway and, and Europe is alarmed by this. Full credit must go to the Russian government and to the Russian people who are supporting the government so massively, so convincingly. The Zionists have planned against Russia for centuries. <laughs> for centuries they've been planning against Russia. The last major military effort on the part of the Zionists to emasculate Russia and reduce it into a third-rate country took place in the Crimean War from 1853 to 1855, for two years the war lasted. And uh, Russia defended Crimea with heroism until eventually the Russians had to withdraw from Crimea and the Western world celebrated their victory. And then in those days, it was a more civilized world. So I think it was Austria who then offered uh, um, peace with Russia and Russia accepted and the conference took place in Paris. And it was called the Peace of Paris where all the parties to the war sat down and I guess drank champagne <laughs> and uh, negotiated a peace treaty. And that peace treaty resulted in Russia having to accept the demilitarization of Crimea. Hence, Russia was not allowed to maintain a naval fleet and a naval port in Crimea. And therefore, the entire southern border of Russia on the uh, Black Sea remained vulnerable to, uh, to the Ottoman Empire, to France, Britain, and so on, to all the naval powers. I think it was within seven years of astute diplomacy on the part of Russia. And Russia was able to turn back that agreement and recover Crimea as a naval base. And Russia held on and has held on to Crimea as a naval base since then. The Western world then responded in 1917 with the Russian Jews bringing about the Bolshevik Revolution. And then installing communism in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union then doing all that they could do to destroy the religious foundation, Orthodox Christianity, killing the priests and destroying their churches and shutting down the monasteries. They did all that they could do until there was no more they could do. And the Christian church still survived. But then they came with the next plan which was in 1954, when the Soviet Union transferred Crimea to Ukraine. Ukraine was a Soviet Republic. And the Soviet Union transferred the territory of Crimea to Ukraine from Russia, without the permission of the Russian people, without consultation with Russia without the permission of the people of Crimea, without consultation with them, why 
did the Soviet Union do that? Answer, there is only one honest answer. Only one honest answer. That the Soviet Union was acting on, on behalf of the Zionists. That's why the Soviet Union did it. After transferring Crimea to Ukraine, the next step in the ladder would be to eventually dismantle the Soviet Union, which they did in the 1980s, so that Ukraine would emerge as an independent state, which it did. And then the next step after that would be to try to get a pro-Western government in Ukraine, which they did with their street demonstrations, and then get Ukraine to become a member of NATO. And then Ukraine will tell Russia, get out of Crimea. We don't want you there. So what they could not do in the Crimean war, because Russia was able to rescind the Treaty of uh, Peace Paris within seven years, they will now do to an independent Ukraine. It is to the credit of the Putin-led government in Russia, to their credit, that they were able to anticipate what was happening because the demonstrations were going on for months in Ukraine, and they acted with great speed brilliance in doing what they did with Crimea within two weeks, within two weeks. The Western world was speechless. They were immobilized, politically immobilized. There was nothing they could do. And Russia took Crimea before their very eyes. This is, in my opinion, the most significant setback that the Zionist movement has ever experienced since its creation in 1897. The loss of Crimea to Russia. The reason why they don't want Russia to have Crimea is because they don't want a Russian fleet, naval fleet, to threaten Israel, that's right. It's all eschatology. And now they're provoking Russia in, in Ukraine because in addition to the problem of the Russian fleet in Crimea, there is now the new threat because of BRICS. Russia, as I mentioned earlier, Russia is leading the way to create an alternative an alternative to the petrodollar monetary system. And if Russia succeeds, that's goodbye to Western dominance over the world. Okay? So you have to provoke Russia to eventually lead to a war with Russia that would provide an opportunity for the petrodollar monetary system to survive. The Russians have already won over Crimea. And they are showing great skill, brilliance in Ukraine. They allow their Ukrainian army to kill more than 2,000 Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine. Kill. An army killing its own people. <laughs> more than 2,000. If this had occurred in any other part of the world, the Western world would have been crying at the top of their voices, shouting, screaming. This is oppression. This is genocide. This is this and this is that. And calling for the United Nations, calling for intervention, all kind of thing. No fly zone or whatever. The way Canada is now barking like a dog over Ukraine. That's how they were barking like dog over other parts of the world. Libya and Syria and so on. But Russia did not intervene. Russia held her hand so that the world would see the, the, Ukra the Eastern Ukrainian people fighting for freedom from oppression. To see them back to the wall and they're being killed by a superior force. Russia acted with great skill and brilliance in waiting and biding its time. And then Russia pulled off another stunt 
which is absolutely beautiful, the humanitarian convoy. They love it, the Western world, these hypocrites. That we don't have to get a permission of a government to send in a humanitarian convoy. No, we don't need your permission. Human rights prevail over the rights of the state. <laughs> well, I live to see the day when Russia did the same thing. And Russia said, well, we don't need the Ukrainian government permission. We asked for it, we didn't get it. We move it in. We're going to do what you did in Syria. It was brilliant. And once we do it the first time, we could do it any more time we want. The Western world is not prepared to respond militarily over an issue where they would lose public opinion. No, not a humanitarian convoy. And now look at southern Ukraine. In order to divert the fighting from that area where the Ukrainian army is gaining the upper hand, what they did was to open another front in the south. Which, which potentially leads more of greater strategic danger to Ukraine. Because it opens a land route between Russia and Crimea. And once Russia takes that land route, there's no way that Russia, Ukraine can ever get it back. Ukraine will then become a landlocked country. So this was a brilliant move. And when the Western world again with their typical hypocrisy, um, protesting that Russia has invaded Ukraine and Russian soldiers are in Ukraine, listen to the Russian ambassador at the UN. As though the words were on a gramophone record, Mike, uh, uh, tape recorder, exactly what they were saying he then said. No, no, no. These are retired Russian military officers. And these are people who are on leave from their jobs. These are not active, <laughs> active Russian soldiers. Exactly the same thing that they were doing. And now they are protesting because Russia is doing the same thing. In the Quran, Allah says, Jazao sayyia sayyia to mithwaha. That the punishment that is befitting for an evil deed is a punishment that is commensurate to the deed. Mm -hmm. So we say to Canada what the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago once said when his, his opponents were shouting too hard, too hard, loudly, using all kind of violent language. So Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Williams said, which is what we now say to Canada. Let the dogs bark. Let the dogs bark. Give them the time to bark. That's all they're doing, barking. What Canada is saying, and the Canadian protests have absolutely no zero, no influence, no significance at all. Zero significance. Putin is winning the game in Crimea, or won the game in Crimea. He's winning the game in Ukraine. And for the first time ever, the Zionists are finding themselves facing a force that is able to deal with them and outmaneuver them. And so credit to Putin and credit to Russia. Well, it just mimics the time of the Soviet Union, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, they're threatening more sanctions against Russia. It, it, it was certainly in a, in a period of escalating conflict between the West and Russia. The Cuban missile conflict took place when Washington was led by a man who, like Jimmy Carter, had some measure of decency and integrity within him even while he was playing games with Marilyn Monroe and so on. Uh, Jack Kennedy uh, was genuinely sorry over the attempt by the CIA to overthrow the Indonesian government. 
he was genuinely sorry of the fact that the, the Zionists had taken control to an agreement, a contract of a mountain of gold in Indonesia, which was being mined. And the Indonesian government could not recover it. The contract was signed by the previous Dutch government. And when Kennedy became president of the United States, he made an effort to try to correct these wrongs. And that was when he reached out to Sukarno and invited Sukarno to come to Washington. And to his credit, Sukarno was courageous enough to accept the invitation because there was a lot of hatred for the for the United States in Indonesia. After all, the Indonesians had shot down an aeroplane and captured the pilot, the American pilot, who worked for the CIA. And when they captured that pilot, when he confessed that I worked for the CIA, and this is a CIA plot to overthrow the government, that man would have faced a death penalty in Indonesia. His wife in the United States appealed to Sukarno to forgive her husband and set him free. And Sukarno showed magnanimity by forgiving the man and sending him back to his wife. There was a lot of hatred for the United States in Indonesia. So when Kennedy invited Sukarno. It was a surprise that Sukarno accepted that. A surprise that the invitation was extended and a surprise that he accepted. And the Zionists didn't like that one bit. And don't you ever forget that the Soviet Union was created by the Zionists. When Sukarno went to the United States, they planned for him the press, the media, to try to destroy him at the very beginning. So at the first press conference, they cornered him. Mr. President, what's the difference between an American politician and an Indonesian politician? The question was loaded because they wanted to have a discussion on American democracy and Indonesian democracy. That's what they wanted. Sukarno had a brilliant reply. He said, American politicians kiss the baby and shake the mother's hands. Indonesian politicians shake the baby's hand and kiss the mother's. <laughs> the Zionist press was appalled because there was no way they could respond to this man. The rest of America was laughing. The rest of America loved him. Jack Kennedy loved him. <laughs> because both Jack Kennedy and Sukarno loved women. And he didn't have any problem for the rest of his talk. Jack Kennedy supported Sukarno for Indonesia to recover control of the gold. The mining of gold. The Zionists didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when Kennedy was assassinated, and thank Allah that we now have a confession from Jackie Kennedy herself, Jacqueline Kennedy, that she says, I suspect Lyndon Johnson to be the man who was a part and parcel of the assassination of my husband. She just said that. It just came out. As soon as Kennedy was assassinated, what's the first thing that, Kennedy, that Johnson did? The very first thing that Johnson did was to reverse American policies on Indonesia. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. The Cuban Missile Crisis has to be understood in the context of a Zionist world order which is becoming increasingly... In Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country in the world, is that right? After the world of Islam had been broken up into bits and pieces, then one of the pieces is Indonesia, 
and it's the biggest of the pieces. <laughs> Instead of saying it's the biggest Muslim country in the world, you could say out of the many pieces that now exist, this is the biggest piece. <laughs> yeah. This is the biggest piece, yeah. Okay, we were talking about uh, Indonesia and the United States, Indonesia and the Zionists in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis to get a better handle on uh, on Kennedy and uh, to go behind the scenes to try to discern the story which has never as yet been told, which has never as yet been told in respect of the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States over Cuba. Mm -hmm. That story has never yet been told, and I don't think that I myself totally understand it, but I have some inklings of what it could be the in, in a story. Yeah. Now, when uh, one of the reasons why they so badly wanted Sukarno that they eventually had to pull off that stunt with Suharto, who was a junior military officer, and they had to slaughter five, I think, Indonesian generals of the armed forces. Five of them were killed in order for Suharto to take over the country. And then the, the other one jumped out of the window and saved Nasutian. Uh, and then Suharto proceeded to rule over Indonesia on behalf of the Zionists for some 30 years until <laughs> his time was up. But one of the reasons why they so badly wanted Suharto, I never knew it, was that when Indonesia became independent of the Dutch, Sukarno called in some of the scholars of Islam to talk to them about the Indonesian money. And after he heard what the scholars of Islam had to say, he offered a proposal, a suggestion, that the Indonesian rupiah in paper would function essentially as a promissory note, as a check, and it would be redeemable in gold at the rate of 20, 20 Indonesian rupiah being equivalent to two ounces of gold, or two, yeah, two ounces of gold, probably. A scholar, an Indonesian scholar, wrote a book on the gold dinar and the silver dirham in the context of Indonesia. And in that book, he documented this information from direct sources, <laughs> that this was what Sukarno wanted. But this is not what the Zionists wanted. No. They wanted a monetary system that could be disengaged from gold. And that's why the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, which was, I think, in 1945, 44-45, prohibited the use of gold as money. Yeah. So this is yet one more reason why the, the Zionists and the CIA were gunning for Sukarno and Indonesia. Now, what is the untold story behind the Cuban Missile Crisis? I, I am sure one day it will come out. But I'm sure that what we know of is the official story of two combatants who are in mortal combat with each other. And it could have come about to a nuclear war. That could have happened, a nuclear war. I believe, Maurice, that there's more to it than meet the eye. I believe that the Cuban Missile Crisis may have offered an opportunity for those who wanted to get rid of Kennedy to, to give him a battering in the cold, to make him unpopular. Mm -hmm. The fact that Kennedy was able to make a deal with the Soviet Union and uh, the Soviet Union agreed to withdraw her missiles from Cuba in exchange for an American mis withdrawal of missiles from Turkey, that agreement was never published. <laughs> the world never knew about that agreement. All that the world knew was that the, the Soviet Union had agreed to withdraw her missiles from, from, from Cuba, uh, that Kennedy was able to save himself from, from, a, from a lynching from the American people. Uh, I hope that one day that story will come out of what was the behind the scenes in the 
Cuban Missile Crisis. But the Soviet Union acted on behalf of the, the, the Zionists, clearly, without any doubt, in handing over Crimea to Ukraine in 1954. And then the, the, the Zionist plan unfolded with the demand, dismantling of the Soviet Union so that NATO could then take over all the states in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, which were not a part of Russia. And NATO proceeded, proceeded to do precisely that. But the, the apple of all was Ukraine, to get Ukraine to become a member of NATO. If Ukraine could become a NATO member, by the Russia in Crimea. And that's what happened last December, after April, with the, with the demonstrations in Kiev, and eventually the Ukrainian president having to flee. The way Russia responded, I told you, uh, gave to the, the Zionists the most significant setback they've ever experienced in their history with the loss of Crimea. So Russia remains firmly in control of a naval base, and Russia remains a naval power in the Black Sea. Now all that remains is for the drama to play out in, in Ukraine, which eventually might lead to the big war, might lead, Zionists have to choose when they want to have big war. But Russia is showing that she's not prepared to back down. No, she's not prepared to back down. And she's going to give you a tit for tat. Every single ruse and deception you use against her, she'll use it against you. And so she's doing that, doing that now in Ukraine. It's inevitable that the big war will take place. That's inevitable. And the inevitable that when the big war takes place, I believe um, uh, um, Paris is going to wipe out Europe and North America. Nobody can live in Europe and North America after that big war because it's thousands of nuclear weapons that are going to be used. And this is what Israel wants. But the good news is that Russia will survive Armageddon. Russia will survive the Malhama. How do we know that? We know that from the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, about the conquest of Constantinople in the end time. And both Christian eschatology and Islamic eschatology speak with one voice, one voice on this issue of the conquest of Constantinople in the end time. From the side of Islam, we know more. But the conquest of Constantinople will take place on the basis of an alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians. There's only one military significance, only one, after such a conquest of Constantinople. It break the back of NATO in Constantinople, and therefore release the Bosphorus from the control of the Zionists. And the release of the Bosphorus from the control of the Zionists has only one military implication. That's of significance. And that is that the Russian Navy can now pass through the Bosphorus. So when we read, we realize that Russia is going to survive this big war. And the Russian Navy will still survive. Wars will not be fought after the nuclear war with anything in the sky. No. After the big war, the oil wars are going to be fought is on the land on the sea. And Russia will remain a naval power. And that Navy, the Russian Navy, is going to threaten Israel. Quite an education and an amazing parallel with the Cuban Missile Crisis and what is happening today with Ukraine. I mean, NATO would gladly put missiles in Ukraine. In the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Russia was still under the control of a Zionist-created Soviet <laughs> Union. So the Zionists had control on both sides. But with Kennedy, that control is beginning to slip out of their hands. And we saw a dramatic example of that in Kennedy's relationship with Sukarno in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. The story of Kennedy and Sukarno is still so sensitive 
that the man who wrote that book, let me show it to you. Hold on a minute. His name is Sheikh, Sheikh Al Faroji. He's Indonesian. And this is his book. This wow. is his book. Yeah. Sheikh Al Faroji. Uh, it is not in English. <laughs> it is in Indonesian. But he, he gave me a copy. This is the manuscript, not the published one. It's still being published. Mm -hmm. uh, manuscript form. The Return of Dinar Dirham by Sheikh Al Faroji Asmar Khan, who's half of the Quran. That book had to be censored in order to be published. And he had to take out of the book certain portions of the thing that I have just mentioned in my interview with you. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm out of energy. <laughs> well, I'm glad that our viewing audience uh, in different parts of the world uh, would have this opportunity for me to share with them my views on ISIS, which is a Zionist-created entity, uh, so you could deceive mankind and deceive the Muslims with a bogus caliphate. Um, that the, the listening audience and viewing audience around the world would have a chance to understand the great war which is coming. And it is so sad that the world of Islamic scholarships speaks nothing about it. No. <laughs> they don't even know about it. The great war is around the corner. It's coming. And, uh, our viewing audience would now know for the first time that the Great War or Armageddon or the Balhaba will be fought for the mountain of gold. That's why it will be fought. The mountain of gold symbolizing the petrodollar monetary system that the Zionists need to maintain their control over the world. And that 99 out of every 100 will be killed will be those who are fighting for the gold, those who are fighting to preserve the monetary system, and those who are opposing the control of the Zionists over the monetary system. These are the ones who will die. So I don't think Indonesians will die from the Great War. But if you're living in London, goodbye. <laughs> if you're living in Paris, goodbye. If you're living in New York, if you're living in Montreal and Ottawa and Toronto, goodbye, because you're not going to survive the Malabana. No. Hmm. It, it's saying two o'clock. It's saying five past two. It's saying, it is saying a few minutes to ten. Well, you're right. I can read the Arab numbers, but it's backwards. That's right. <laughs> because, <laughs> because this one goes... Anti-clockwise. Yes. Well. And that one goes clockwise. Yes. Well. So this is anti-systemic. Good. That's what we need. <laughs> this is anti-systemic, yeah. And that one is systemic. And we don't want to be systemic. No, not at all. We In the to... world controlled by Dajjal, we want to be anti-systemic. <laughs> yeah. 